Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Under the Shell, presented by Terrapin Sports Central. In today's episode, we'll be featuring our first ever head coach of a Maryland athletic program. Coach Alex Clemson from the wrestling team will be joining us. Special episode for episode 10. Yeah. 10 episodes, fellas. The big one out. We made wow. it. Milestone. <laughs> put us on Put us on Spotify 100. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Pretty close to that. Yeah. I would we got to get, so. get our stats. Yeah. Hopefully we're on someone's Spotify yeah, wrapped. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Someone probably listened to Eight us. Eight million listens. <laughs> In case you don't know, I'm Sam Jane. That's Brennan Wiesel. Michael Big Mike House. And I'm Kevin Ireland. And what are we starting with? Yeah. Well, theme of the episode. Start, start, with, start with wrestling. Start with wrestling. Start with wrestling. Let's uh, let's dive into the interview with Alex Clemson, and then we'll uh, we'll give our takes on the wrestling season so far, and uh, what we got looking forward to. All right, so, uh, Coach, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Um, very happy to report, first ever head coach on the podcast, so thank you very much. Um, so if you want to start off, tell listeners a little bit about um, kind of how you arrived at the University of Maryland. Uh, obviously, you were wrestler yourself and then translated over to the coaching sphere. Uh, tell people how you got there. Yeah, I mean, been wrestling my whole life. I um, was the son of a coach. Uh, my dad um, was a high school coach, and basically my whole life until I became a high school athlete myself and then he kind of stepped back but um so I was kind of grew up in the home of an educator and a coach and um went to college out east and um at Edinburgh University I always tell people it's like the Gonzaga of wrestling it's this little tiny niche school with um really good division one wrestling and um I redshirted with injury my third year and spent a lot of time just, you know, around the sport, but not being an athlete per se. I was rehabbing and uh, had two major surgeries and uh, just kind of got to see Coach Roselli and Coach Flynn interact on a daily basis and what they did. And um, I was like, man, this, these guys have a lot of fun. This this might be a cool gig. And kind of from there, I just said, you know what, that's that's what I want to do. And out of, out of school, I, I got an opportunity to go out to Oregon State and be a director of ops and work on an MBA. And then after two years of being out at Corvallis, uh, Steve Garland had an opening on his staff at the University of Virginia. I jumped there for five years and then had a chance to go home and be the associate head coach at the University of Missouri, um, where we had a lot of success. Uh, we were basically like the fourth best program over that five-year run. And uh, that opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities and, and had a couple schools call that didn't seem like the right timing or the right fit. And, uh, and then the Maryland job presented itself. And um, I had had a previous relationship with the sports supervisor, Mark Sherburn, and we had known each other for quite a while. And he called and asked if I'd be interested in applying. And I said, sure. And they offered an interview and then here I am. And uh, we're four years into this rebuild or we started, we started our fourth year. And we're finally starting to move the needle a little bit. We broke into the coach's poll. We broke it into two of the, the major media polls. And uh, um, we're, we're starting to click a little bit. And you talked about how, you know, this is year four of the rebuild. And I think a lot of time, year four, year three, that's when, you know, coaches, recruits start to really, you know, give credence to um, – you know, come to light in terms of what their philosophy was. And at Missouri, you were well known for being one of the more elite recruiters in the, in the country. Do you have any like funny stories or, or, or like anything you can reveal about like you sitting down with a prospect or, or not a prospect, a high school kid or something, or like talking strategy with him? Like, what was that like for you, you know, being in the living rooms of families and things like that? Well, every living room is different. You never know what you're going to walk into um unless you know the family right um but i'll give you a funny story jackson cockrell a 33 pounder i don't know if it was it wasn't the first home visit we had done together as a staff um because we saw ethan miller uh the night before in kansas city and then we drove to tulsa the next morning and saw jackson the next morning we might have been down to see jackson smith already too but one of the first ones we've been on, and it was the first one where the three of us were together. Nick and I had, had done a couple, and and uh, but Coach Mellon was with us on this one, and we're in the cock, in Cockrell's home, and and we're we're we've made our pitch, and it's going pretty well, and and uh, I'm about to drop it, you know, like 
like lay it down and be like, all right, like you're in, right? Like you're coming to Maryland. You want to be a part of what we're doing. And uh, I'm, le- we're sitting at the dining room table and I'm leaned back in the chair. So I'm like, you know, I'm balancing, I'm teetering. <laughs> and the damn chair broke underneath my fat ass. <laughs> I'm like, oh, we're not getting this kid. Like all the work I just did, all the like, you know, uh, the, the the visit the you know it's going smooth we're clicking and uh and right when i'm about to you know mic drop i break the chair and uh but but you know jackson's our 33 founder he's here and, and he's you know was a part of that first recruiting class who's part of the three top 100 kids that we got in the first class so that was pretty good but you know strategy it's everything everybody's different you're always trying to read the room and you're trying to decide who's the gatekeeper, right? Who's the decision maker? What are the things that, you know, they're looking for? What are the things that would keep them from choosing Maryland? And and you're you're just trying to hit on, you know, what makes Maryland a great place and and why it's the right fit or the best fit for their son and their family. And um, I don't really believe in negative recruiting. Um, I think we've got enough great things to sell here. The region right? The media market, the fact that we're in the Big Ten, the premier wrestling conference in the country, but really the premier sports conference, right? When you think about college athletics, there's no better conference for college athletics than Big Ten wrestling. Um, it's, it's actually not even close. Not, nothing really even comes close to it. So um, I think there's that. And then the fact that, you know, it's a top 20 public school, um, there's just there's so many great things to sell it i don't think we, we need to speak negatively about other kids opportunities in other places i just think it's uh low class and uh um not very creative so we try to focus on all the great things about maryland and what makes you know wrestling for clemson and company different and cool and special and um I think it takes kids that are maybe wired a little different families that are wired a little different to choose to come wrestle here and be a part of what we're doing. And uh, for the families that it does click with um, it clicks and it's, it's why we're having the success we're having. Yeah. The negative recruiting is, I think something that you said, Don, is that something that like, as you become a head coach, you found like this, pretty prevalent throughout college wrestling or is that something that just like a few select schools engage in uh i mean it it happens all the time i mean it happened when i was assistant um i I always think when people negative recruit you um it's because you scare them i think when people feel like they have to bash you or they have to put you down it's because they're afraid of you um i I think we're at a point now where we're probably going to be pretty annoying to a lot of the, the, you know, the major players in the country. And I think we'll probably get negative recruited more. Um, and it's probably because, you know, Michigan doesn't want to lose to Maryland in wrestling. Right. Um, and I'm not saying Sean has ever negative recruited me. Um, I just, I use that as a, as an example. Um, but I, I think we'll probably see it more. And, and, and I know it's happening now and I know it's happened in the past and it happened when I was at Missouri. It happened when I was at Virginia. It's just, it's part of the game. Some people, like I said, they, they, they rely on it because they're not creative and uh, they, they don't have a lot of great things to sell about themselves and, and, the, and the situation that they have. So they have to say negative things about you. And um, So I, I make sure families know that. Yeah, so heading to the mat, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the pleasure to sit down with Jaron and um, was asking him about maybe the coaching philosophy that you guys have. But if uh, – Looking up and down the roster, would you say that you would try to get got, or maybe in practice focus on either getting out from a bottom position or like you want to focus on getting that riding time if you're starting on top? Because Jaron was talking about, yeah, definitely need the escape point and that can be a deciding factor. And uh it should be interesting to hear your take on that. Well, they're both important and we spend a lot of time on on both. Um I mean, typically we spend a day on 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 the mat at minimum um, every week. Uh, 
sometimes it's two days, sometimes one day is bottom, sometimes one day is top. I mean, mat wrestling in, in college, especially in the Big Ten, it's so physical and it's so taxing and it's so draining that you have to be able to – mat wrestling is like a running game, right? you got to be able to stop the run, right? Let's get off bottom and you got to be able to run the ball, and that's that's riding. Um, so it's, it's, it's just really important. So um, I think Jaron maybe naturally uh, – has a little better better feel for his top game, so maybe he focuses more on the fact that he needs to, you know, continue to develop the opportunity to get off the bottom. But they're they're both super super important, and uh, I think for young kids, uh, bottom maybe is a little harder. Um, some of that speed of the game, right? Speed of the match. Some of it is the physicality and uh, just not feeling a grown man on top of you, really trying to impose his will. So um, there's just, I think, some time that it takes some young kids on bottom. So usually in the summer when our freshmen, when our first year kids get in, we spend a considerable amount of time in the summer on bottom just trying to get kids up to speed. Yeah, so again, going on that uh, topic of being on the bottom, would you say that you guys try to coach a certain guy to his maybe the best visibility maybe a certain move that he can work on or just get out any way you can based on your yeah. matchup yeah i mean i i never think about well i shouldn't say never right but we try to focus on what our guys need to do and what we need to 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 execute in order to be successful if you're worried about what the other guy's doing all the time you're, you're going to be playing catch up constantly um so but in terms of you know, how we develop any position, we really take a, I think, a, an individual approach to it where, you know, you, you don't need to try to fit square pegs in a round holes and, and things are going to look different for different body shapes. Things are going to look different for different um, athleticism levels. Things are going to look different for just people's comfort. And uh, we've got a staff, I, I feel, that's diverse in the sense of, we, we've got similar backgrounds and track methods, uh, but we also have individual skill sets that we can exploit at times. You know, I'll give you, for example, on bottom, I was a quarter turn stand up guy. I know that's, that probably doesn't, you know, mean much to you guys. Uh, Coach Mellon was a tripod guy, and Coach Brissetta was a sit guy. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is, Coach Brissetta was trained by a guy that was trained by a guy that trained me, and I trained Coach Mellon. So, but it's an individual sport. Um, so different, different things work for different people and, and there's no magic bullet, right. In wrestling, it's a martial art really at its core. Wrestling is a martial art. I mean, it's a fist fight without punches and kicks and a, and a very specific set of rules. So there's no magic bullet. There's no like, Oh, this is the, the, the best move. And, and if you can do this move, you can beat everybody. It's not how it works. It's really just like any other sport. It's about execution, right? You, you see that in football. The spread offense is the big thing right now. It used to be, you know, a uh, triple option. And before that, it was the wishbone. You can go on and on. And, and you see that with defenses, whether it's cover twos or, you know, single high safety or whatever it is, right? Things go in trends. I think that's somewhat in wrestling, too. You see trends and you see evolution. and um, uh, But you also see, you know, individuals naturally gravitate towards certain things. And so you have to be well-versed as a coach and as a staff to be able to coach the individual. And I think as a team, you want to have an identity, but um, within that individuals need to be, you know, really focused on and, and developed and, and um, poured into for their specific sets. Going back a little bit to your coaching journey, when you make the transition from assistant to head coach, were there any like duties that kind of shocked you as a head coach? And what was kind of like the most difficult part of that transition? I, you know, I was really lucky, um, both at Virginia and especially at, at Missouri. Um, I, I was empowered uh, to, to have some autonomy and to have a lot of say. Um, and to be involved in a lot of conversations that I think maybe some assistant coaches aren't or some places doesn't operate like that. I think both of my bosses there knew that I wanted to be a head coach and, and respected that and, and wanted to help me develop those skill sets. I think especially late in my career at Missouri, Brian was, you know, a lot of, a lot of, I was in a lot of conversations and a lot of, you know, closed door meetings. And I was with 
ADs and I was at head coaches meetings. And um, so maybe not a lot that shared that shocked me or duties. Um, I will just say it sucks having to be the bad guy, right? It sucks having to be the boogeyman at times. Um, I, I have a saying when there's something shitty that I had to do or something that sucked that I was like, that, that wasn't fun. I'm like, be a head coach, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Um, I just remind myself, you know, this is what you wanted. And and uh, you have to take the good with the bad. You have to take the the things you love with the things you don't. And that's just, that's part of what you do. Um, but I wouldn't trade what I do or um, the life I get to live, you know, for anything else. I, I probably could make a lot more money in sales or in banking. Um, I love coaching wrestling. I love helping kids. So the thought of, you know, being on a plane to go sell widgets or being in a boardroom to meet with executives, I get nauseous, right? I, I like coaching wrestling. I like being around kids. I like uh, competing. I like the heat of the moment. I like the battle. Um, so uh, the good far outweighs the bad. And um, So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, 12 years as an assistant. I saw and experienced a lot too. Um, I paid a lot of dues there. So um, I think I've been pretty fortunate that I was, I was pretty well equipped Um, outside of COVID, right? COVID I think was a curveball for everybody. And I don't, you could have coached 25 years. You you just weren't ready for that. Right. So um, that's, that's probably the the one thing that I've been like, gosh, dang, that's a, that's a doozy there. And we're still dealing with it. And we probably will for the foreseeable future. It's just it's had such an impact on our world. And then you joined Maryland. You were joining a program that had been struggling for a little bit before you came. And then when we talked to Jan a couple of weeks ago, he said that under you, he's noticed a little bit of a culture shift and people are starting to buy in. So when you're a coach and you're entering into a program that struggled a bit, how do you like implement that new culture and make everybody buy in? A great question. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, right? I, I've got a lot of sayings. You guys, you hang out with me long enough, you'll find out I got a lot of sayings, right? I like to use a lot of analogies, but you know, the one that I threw out a lot when I first got here, and I still use it, is Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, but some asshole had to start laying bricks, and we're those assholes. So if we don't start laying bricks, it ain't ever going to get built. And uh, so we just, it, we, one of the things that was really, that attracted me to Maryland was the academics of, of the school, just the, the you know, the competitiveness of, of the school, the, the prowess of the degree, the impact that it can have on a, on a young person's life for the next 40 to 50 years. Uh, it really attracted me. Um, I think the, the one regret I have as a student athlete with the school that I chose was, um, it's just not a great academic institution. Uh, great wrestling, you know, great place to go to school. I love my time there, but my degree isn't, doesn't really mean a whole lot. I, I tell people all the time, it's a good thing I, I, I can sell and I can coach wrestling because um, otherwise I'd probably struggle. Um, I think a degree from Maryland can separate you and can, can help really change kids' lives and trajectories for families. And it was something that was being neglected, I think, by my predecessor, um, not to speak ill, but they weren't winning at anything. I mean, we weren't raising money. We weren't winning wrestling matches. We weren't, um, you know, staying out of trouble. Um, and we weren't competing in the classroom. And I was like, what can we do right away that we can measure to see if the kids are buying in? What can we look at, you know, quantitatively that says, hey, good things are happening and more good things will come. And one was the program had never had a, a cumulative program GPA above a 3.0. They'd had a semester GPA of a 3.0 or higher, but they never had a cumulative. And I said, well, that's, that's got to be a goal. It's just got to be a benchmark that we get to and we get to quickly. First semester didn't happen, GPA. And uh, second semester did. Third semester did. Fourth semester did. And then after the fifth semester, yeah, after the fifth semester, we finally broke into that cumulative team GPA above a 3.0 and then we continued it through the sixth semester and I think knock on wood right we should we should our our seventh semester as well and so it was something I said if, if we can get these kids to go to class 
We can get them to hand in their assignments on time and complete. We can get them to sit for their exams, make their tutor appointments and, and uh, um, do the right things academically. We know they're probably doing the right things in other places too. When they're listening to us there, they're probably listening to us in other places. And uh, um, so that was something that we just me- try to measure right away. And, and I only have two team rules, right? Go to class and live clean. We don't sign a contract. There's no 40 pages. There isn't 150 rules. Go to class and live clean. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't you shouldn't come wrestle for me. We're going to take academics really seriously, and we're not going to be jackasses in our personal life. And uh, um, we have an opportunity to be special and be different here, and you're going to have to sacrifice. Um, our kids probably live a different life than you guys live, right? Um, they, but they choose to do that. So um, it, it just it, – it's different being a student athlete and it's different being a, a Division One wrestler. It's different wrestling at Maryland in the Big Ten for Alex Clemson. So um, our kids could probably tell you this. You, next time you have one of them on, ask them to, to recite the, the go-to-class rule. So it's if you don't go to class, you don't practice. If you don't practice, you don't compete. If you don't compete, I don't know why the hell you're here. And So the next time you have one of our guys on, see if they can give that back to you. I bet they can I say it to them all the time. And, and we get tested on it every year. We have to sit kids out. And I sat Ethan Miller out of practice a couple of weeks ago and, and uh, he skipped the class. And I said, he was walking into practice. He's like, got his little swagger going. And he's what he carries himself pretty well. You know, he's got, got a good way about him. I said, what's up, E? And he's like, what's up coach? I'm like, I don't know. You tell me, bud. He's like, ready for, ready for practice. I said, yeah, you're going to have, you're going to have a fun one today. He's like, I am. I was like, yep, you can sit right in that chair right there. He's like, like you didn't go to math. I'm like, no, you didn't go to math, dog. He's like, uh, I, stop. You didn't go to math. Sit your ass down. He sat there the whole practice and his emotional roller coaster he went through. First, he was, he was irritated. And then he was ashamed. And then he was embarrassed. And then he was angry at me. And then you could tell it switched where it was like it clicked. It's like, nobody would be mad at but himself. He knew the rule. Go to class. You don't go to class, you don't practice. So the second time you miss class, you go and do a study hall during practice. You don't even get a watch. The third time you miss, you sit out of a competition. We haven't had anybody get to strike three. Had one knucklehead get to strike two. We won't name names. Um, but uh, usually it takes one. And uh, the, the, I think the guys, especially the young guys, see that I'm for real. And they're like, oh, shoot, I got to go. So when I say go to class, you go to every class. You go to every tutor session. You sit for every exam and you hand in every assignment on time and complete. And that's, that's that. And the living clean thing's really easy, right? That, that's not too hard. Kids sometimes like to make it hard, but it ain't hard. Yeah, we absolutely will have to uh, give them a little, a little quiz, a little test next time they're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, be interesting. So where did, you know, obviously, like, you have those two messages that you've sent to the team. Where did you personally, like, learn those things? And why do you bring them into your coaching, uh, you know, and why do you bring them into the team? And uh, what, what do yeah. those two values mean to you? Yeah, so, I mean, right, one is, like, the, the go-to-class thing is, uh, is actually, it's Brian Smith at Missouri. Uh, it's, it's one of his rules. He only has a handful of rules, too. Uh, um, but... Uh, I think it's it's really important. The student, you are a student athlete, right? The student thing is first. It really is. And uh, there's a flip side of that too. When I was a student athlete at, at Edinburgh, Bruce Baumgartner, he's the only American uh, U.S. freestyle wrestler in Olympic games to win four Olympic medals. And he always talks about blinders. You have to have blinders. So when you're in math class, you focus on math. You shouldn't be thinking about practice. When you're at practice, you shouldn't be thinking about math class. When you're at home hanging out with your buddies or your girlfriend or you're watching a movie or with your parents, whatever, you should be a kid. And uh, when people have distractions and the lines start to blur, that's when they have difficulties. And Brian talks about it similarly. He says, you know, if you know you're failing math, it's hard to get better at your single leg. If you know you're failing math, it's hard to compete on Friday night. Um, and, and I think at Maryland, you, you really have to be a true student athlete. It's it's a great school, and that's something we sell. And, and we're really honest with, with parents and with kids. Like, if you don't want to be a true student athlete, you don't want to challenge yourself academically, if you don't want to compete um, in the classroom, you shouldn't come here. It, it won't go well. You won't, like, you won't like it. And you won't like me, and I won't like you. It won't be a good fit. Um, and then the live clean part is um, 
there's several layers to it, but part of it is, is I just, I, I don't think that you out train anybody today. I, I think the best programs, the best coaches are doing similar things and they're doing it year round and they're creating atmospheres and environments where kids can really be challenged and, and, and grow. So how do you find an edge, right? How do you, how do you get ahead? How do you close the gap? How do you pass somebody? And I, I just think it comes back to the first pillar of our program, right? Sacrifice. We have the four pillars, sacrifice, sorry, faith, sacrifice, accountability, and perseverance. The second pillar of our program. And the sacrifice piece is we try to talk about, don't think about what you give up, right? Think about what you get in return. So we talk about making a trade and uh, yeah, you, you can't, you can't go to frat parties and you can't do keg stands and you can't be at Bentley's at, you know, 2 AM in, in December. You just can't. I don't think you can be there in, in June either. Um, <clears throat> if you really want to be special, if you really want to be different, if you really want to be great, you're going to have to give something up. And uh, you're going to have to, to live differently. Sure, there's guys that can do it, right? We know probably on our campus right now in other sports, there's kids that can can do things at a really high level that are freaks. They're aliens. I like to call them aliens, right? They can stay up till 2 a.m. and do a cake stand and then go out to their respective sport 24, 48 hours later and light it up. Um, and I know wrestlers that have done it too. I've coached kids that have done it. Um, I don't even think that those kids are doing everything they can and are maximizing their potential. And I want to see kids really chase their fullest potential. I know that sounds corny. It sounds cheesy, but it's like, man, if your potential is to be a starter then be a starter, if your potential is to win the Hodge, which is our Heisman, then win the damn Hodge. Don't just win the nationals, win the Hodge. And, uh, I've, I've coached kids that maybe should have won the Hodge, but they only won the nationals. Uh, I've coached kids that could have been all Americans, but were only starters. And I think that's what's always driving me and always fueling me is you're always trying to help these kids get the most out of themselves. And, um, you know, nobody ever looks back at 30 and says, oh, I wish I would have drank more beer. They say, I wish I would have won more wrestling matches. I've never heard a friend, a, a colleague, a alum, a booster. I've never heard somebody say, man, you know what I wish I'd have done in college? Wish I'd have gone to another frat party. They all, they all say, you, you'll, you'll get together, you have a couple of beers, and they'll be like, man, if I would have lived a little cleaner, if I would have worked a little harder, if I would have sacrificed a little more, I could have, I would have, I should have. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy that, hey, man, I lived it. I did it. And if, if you got there, great, you got there. And if you didn't, you sleep well at night because you know you, you did everything you could when you had the, the moment, you had the opportunity. Yeah, it's true. No one ever looks back and says, oh, I wish I didn't. I wish I trained less. I feel bad about how much hard work I put in. But uh, yep. just going back, I would I would like to mention that my go to move in my short lived wrestling career was the Granby roll from bottom. OK. All right. So, yeah, I was a little lightweight back in my early high school days. But um, looking at the Big it's Ten, awesome. as you mentioned, is a is an absolute gauntlet of a conference. <clears throat> Who would you say your. Um, Maybe not not fearful, but who would you say is your the opponent that you're most looking forward to? <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I always like wrestling my friends. I like competing against my friends. Um, I coached Willie Nicholas at Missouri, and he's on staff at Michigan State. So that's fun. We get to wrestle Michigan State because I love Willie. Um, the, the associate coach at Indiana and I um, used to train together in the summers. He's a little bit older than I, but we worked the same camp system, and I'd always make him work out with me. And we just got to be good good friends, and we stayed good friends in coaching. His name's Mike Dixon. So, um, and our associate, or sorry, our volunteer assistant Elijah Oliver wrestled for them. So that adds a layer too. Um, and then I think like we're always compared to Rutgers, right? Like across all sports, because we came into the league at the same time that they did. So that's a fun match um, as well for that, I think, perspective. And I like Coach Goodale a lot. He's a good guy. We, we, uh, we get along really good. I, I just I always like competing against my friends. Yeah, definitely. And um, we appreciate you, Coach, for coming on. We only got a 
couple more minutes here left. It was awesome to be able to hear some of your perspectives and take us through what it's like to be a head coach at a, you know, what hopes to be a high level program here coming up soon. So thank you again for coming on. And, you know, you bring a lot of, you gave us a lot of insight into wrestling, but you're in Missouri, now Maryland. Soon you're going to be getting the journalism. I mean, those are two pretty good journalism schools. So you're, you're, you're entering our field a little bit here too. Yeah, no doubt. Two great journalism schools, right? Um, if, if I could do anything other than coach wrestling, right? Like legitimately, like if I could really do anything, I'd say I want to be a NASCAR driver. I love driving. <laughs> like, I, dude, I think I'm like born to drive a car, right? But I, you have to grow up in the South and it's got to be like in your family. So it's like, that ain't happening. But I think if I could do anything else, like I want to be like, I want to host a like show like PTI. I watched yeah. their first ever show as a junior in high school. I watched their first ever show. I was a senior in high school. But uh watched their first ever show. And uh, I would have been a senior, I think, because it was the first time I didn't play a sport in the fall. And they started that fall of 2001, I, I think. Pretty sure. And, uh, um, uh, they're you know, now that I'm in the DMV, I'm like, they're right there. And they're always having these guest hosts. And I'm like, yo. Will Bond, when you're out in Phoenix and you, you're late night NBA, you need a fill in. Like, I'm your dude. Like, Kornheiser, when like you're stuck in the attic, like, I'm the guy to fill in for you. I'm telling you, I'll bring it. Um, so, but that, that's my, that'd be like, that'd be a fun, that'd be a fun gig. If I wasn't coaching wrestling, have a show yeah. like PTI. Maryland grad on PTI. So we, we got to get you, got to get you hooked up with that. Yeah. Dominique Foxworth, right? He, he's on, uh, he's on quite a bit. Um, I ran into him at a football game one time, dapped him up, told him I love listening to him. We've gone back and forth on Twitter a couple times. Um, he He's on around the horn a little bit. Um, I don't know if he's been on PTI or not, but, um, yeah, man, I, if uh, if somebody could make that happen for me, that'd be like a bucket list, like throwing out the first pitch at uh, Wrigley Field or singing uh, um, uh, the seventh inning stretch. So. Absolutely. Definitely try to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's get we'll, that done. We'll pull some strings for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. we know. Trust, trust. Yeah. I, don't, yeah, I don't know how many strings we can pull, yeah, but we'll certainly probably, try. Yeah, but we'll, we'll use them. <laughs> oh, love it. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you having me on, man. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do do some special things here. It's, it is a, it's a juggernaut, the league, but that's also why I came. And I think that's why kids want to come to Maryland, too. So. Um, I said when we when I came here, I didn't come here not to win. Uh, we're 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 moving the needle. Um, Damon Evans asked me in the interview. He said, "Give me a synopsis. Where do you think we'll be? How long it's going to take?" And I said, "I think by year four we can be competitive, and I think in year six we're going to be pretty good." Um, I think I'm on schedule. So certainly on track. Yeah. One more thing, real quick, Coach. Uh, you got to do me a favor and and bring it to Ohio State because their head coach is friends with my mom. Coach Tom Ryan. <laughs> oh, you know, uh, Tom's a good guy. Um, we look at the world, I think, a little differently at times. Um, but, man, he's done a tremendous job there. Uh, tremendous job. So uh, I would I would like to beat them. Their associate head coach and I are, are friends, and their other assistant and, and our one of our assistants are, are buddies. So that's fun, too, at times. But, man, th- th- their program's ahead of us right now. Um, but dual meets are all about matchups. There's only 10 weights. So I haven't even thought about that, that duel and, and how we match up. Um, we, we got a tough Navy squad uh, next Sunday, and then we go to Scuffle and Virginia Duels and the Indiana match. I mean, we got a little bit before there, but um, one step I'll at see a time. I, yeah. I'll, I'll see what I, what I can do about, about giving it to old Tom Ryan. I'd like to, that'd be a nice win. I'd like to do that too. So. You do that Sounds and we'll get good. you on uh, PTI. So we'll trade. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, you guys are great. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, good luck the rest of the season, and we're looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Coach. Take care. Yeah, guys, really entertaining interview with uh, Coach Clemson. I mean, guy comes over from Missouri to Maryland. I mean, he's really now getting a chance to run a program, and um, he's got Maryland in a place they really haven't been in a really long ranked. time. I know. Are you for, kidding? First time ranked since 2013, to the guys. Land. I mean, that's a huge – Huge step in the right direction for the program, especially competing in a wrestling powerhouse like the Big Ten. I mean, um, you know, when you're in a tough conference like that, we always talk about how can Maryland 
um, athletics find a way in like sports like volleyball, track and field? How are they able to compete in these conferences? And Clemson's showing that it's possible, even if the historic, um, you know, notoriety of the program isn't necessarily there. Yeah, the one thing I will say is though they haven't seen the Big Ten yet. That's right? a good point. So, you know, rank twenty fourth. You know, a bunch of different rankings out there, but NCAA rankings twenty fourth, which is huge, right? Something none of us at, at this table expected going into the season. They're now ranked. They have a bunch of wrestlers who are, you know, in the top 25, in the top 30, are going to make an impact on the NCAA stage. But we really don't know how impactful Maryland will have of a season until they face the Big Ten. I do got to say, the win against Pitt proves that they can compete against these teams. You know, they got a perennial WWE superstar of Jerome Smith. <laughs> friend uh, of the pod. Friend of the pod. And then, of course, Coach Clemson's completely changed the culture there and it's gotten guys to buy in. Yeah, I think um, you've seen success from guys across the board. They got, was it, seven guys ranked? Uh, the yep. Miller boys are pulling their weight. Jaron Smith, Jackson Smith, the heavyweights are definitely getting it done on the mat. So it's they've enjoyed this nice little Thanksgiving break and looking to get back after it uh, when they travel to Annapolis to take on Navy. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just to hear from a head coach and kind of give us some insight into the program and, and specifically his role. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was that was super interesting, and, and different coaches have different philosophy, guys, and and we all know about that. So hearing from Clemson was huge, um, and a coach that you know <laughs> is making his philosophies well known to Maryland fans, Kevin Willard and the boys. Mm-hmm. How about it, fellas? I mean, Kevin, you want to take us through what they've done so far here? Yeah, Coach Willard is putting the nation on notice. They've been putting in dominant performances night after night. Just improved to seven and zero after comfortable 25 point win over the struggling louisville which is struggling Louisville's struggling awful. to say the least <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of kind of sad to see such a downfall from no the team that went from a national championship with a little asterisk next next to that <laughs> we'll count it count the national yeah, championship the michigan the block by trade brick was clean for all my for all my for my grandmother who no, listens no. back home kevin ware put his leg on the line <laughs> <laughs> so, not um, only his leg <laughs> yeah um i'm gonna have to say yeah louisville not looking great this year but maryland Easy to handle, um, easily handled that task. Uh, they've handled each test they faced, and, but they haven't really faced any big challenges so far. And we saw them take down St. Louis, who had some votes early in the first week of the year. Maryland completely dismantled them with a comfortable win. But Willard's got some Warriors on the court. He's got four starters averaging double figures, each of them over 13 points in Dante Scott, Jameer Young, uh, Julian Reese, and Hakeem Hart, each over 13 points. Don Carey's pulling his weight as well, staying hot for beyond uh, the arc, hit down those knockdown threes, down the stretch. And they've looked pretty solid defensively. you got Hakeem Hart, Ian Martinez, and Jahari Long are each averaging at least one steal. And Juju Reese is up there as well. Uh, Scott and Reese are also protecting the rim. They've been getting blocks, getting those uh, big defensive plays, protecting the basket. And just to take a look at, like, the – margin of victories that they've been experiencing they're averaging about 60 points against per game and they've been averaging 60 uh, 82 points for per game so yeah. they're playing good defensively but they're also putting points on the board yeah willard um a stat I, I saw was willard's the first coach in big 10 history to win each of his first seven games by at least 15 points big 10's been around for a long time uh, that and then and it's not like they're playing just straight cupcakes for the first seven games cavett talked about the miami game the st louis game i'm mean, louisville's awful but that's still mm-hmm. an acc opponent but they did what they're supposed to do against them like the yeah, maryland teams exactly. in the past would face those you know lower level opponents and they'd at the end of the game they have to be hit buzzer beaters to beat them play down they've right. played and down they've, their level but we've seen them they're playing to their level yeah. and they're not Mm-hmm. Caring what the other team. I yeah. thought I thought a quote by Willard coming into today was super interesting. Cavett kind of talking about the defense and and how they've how they've looked. I mean, something that I think a lot of coaches wouldn't say, and and I don't know if Willard necessarily is fully believes this, but I mean, it seems that you know the results speak for itself. He said that um, as long as guys are a hundred percent committed to what they're doing on the defensive end, he doesn't care what type of shot they get on the offensive or what type of you know. Um, offense they're producing on the other side so being able to have that freedom on the offensive end as a player that's incredibly like just like allows you to play free and and play within the flow of the offense when you're not stressing you know necessarily about oh is my coach going to yank me because I didn't execute this set play right on offense you know I did I not make the right read out of a pick and roll rather it's much easier defense is all about communication team effort obviously individual um, skills come into play but being able to run your scheme and make sure guys aren't, you know, 
um, getting straight drive drive by layups without any help. That's that's the key of defense is communication and help helping your teammate. So I thought that was super interesting to see from Willard. Yeah, I mean, just like that, Willard's been trying to build his team from the ground up, starting with the defensive side of the ball and then once you get the stop on defense it takes so a lot of weight off your off shoulders offense. when you get the ball yeah so much easier and, then, and also talking about the boards they the big men dante scott and julian reese they've been mm-hmm. getting those second chance points and it's just dante it's scott has dante scott huge. Been electric mm-hmm. yeah he's yeah. been really good for sure coming having, having that senior season that i th- I think a lot of people sophomore, li- mm-hmm. myself no not scott senior juju reese is the sophomore okay gotcha. but scott has like taken a leap mike and i know we talked about you know, Reese and, and what you thought of him. How, what have you seen from him early on here? Julian Reese, I mean, obviously the first game, we thought he was a little bit disappointed on the offensive end. But then the last few games, I mean, every single game since then, he's been pretty good offensively. Obviously, Dante Scott and Reese, those have been the two main scores, leading scores for each game. But then you look at, like, the offense. They play together as a team. They're not going to solely depend on one guy mm-hmm. to lead them through. They play as a team, like Cavett said, with the offensive numbers. There's four starters averaging double digits, and if you look at their point totals, they're all pretty close together. So they play as a team, and then I think someone interesting to watch offensively against Illinois is going to be Jameer Young. We talked earlier about, yeah, he was supposed to compete and play well against the opponents they've played so far. Right. He played great at Charlotte the past three years, but how is he going to play against Illinois? We've seen his numbers decrease a little bit so far this year. He's averaged 19 points uh, last year. This year, he average he's averaging only 13. So is he going to perform well against Illinois and like keep up that offensive production, or is he going to you know the competition factor is that going to play in a little bit against these Big Ten teams that Maryland's going to face throughout the season? Yeah, I think a uh, big thing about his drop off in um, like statistical point production is that he's now part of more of a mm-hmm. team, more of like a balanced team yeah. where he's not the main guy who's getting the rock guy, every sure. time, mm-hmm. but he is he's creating chances too. He's he's up to uh, a little over three assists on the year averaging so he's definitely getting himself involved still even if he's not the one necessarily putting the ball in the cup yeah definitely and, and that kind of leads a segue mike talking about that competition because um you know maryland's we, they've had some good wins but th- this is going to be the marquee game for terps fans illinois number 16 illinois comes to town on friday for a gold rush um illinois coming off wins over ucla and syracuse um, scoring 83 points per game. Brendan, what do you see in the Illini, and, and how do you think um, Maryland matches up with them? I mean, like you said, gold's going to be in the air, and uh, speaking on, on that type of color, I have no idea I'm going with that, but what I was going to say is you look <laughs> at the Illinois schedule, um, started off pretty easy, played four games that really um, not too much test. Five games. Yeah. And then they played uh, UCLA, mm-hmm. who Maryland is also going to play. opponent. Um, and so you look there. Um, Illinois was able to take care of them. I think uh, if you think about the game um, coming up on Friday, I think it's going to be very close. And I think that uh, one thing that Kemmer Willard said is um, worried about his players going out of the gates too hot and then getting tired as the game goes on. It's the first time many of these players, transfers, seniors, you know, obviously Dante Scott, he's been there, but some of the transfers never played in games this big in this type of environment. And so I think if Maryland can get out to a start where they're comfortable and they don't tire themselves out, they'll be able to take care of the, the win and do that at the end of the game. But if they go out there and they you know, are frazzled by the crowd and frazzled by the moment, then I think it's going to be a, Illinois could win by 10, 15 points. Defense, 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 Illinois, they average 83 points per game. We talked about how that defense is playing great right now. Will they continue to play great against yeah. a Big Ten team that can score the ball? Yeah, some guys to look out for if you're Illinois. Terrence Sharon, Shannon, Coleman Hawkins, I think, are the two biggest huge, um, two biggest tests for Maryland in terms of scoring wings. Maryland's, um, we haven't talked about it, but really the problem with Maryland, I think, when you're looking at their overall roster is the lack of depth, especially at the center position. Nobody really is a proven commodity at the backup center for behind Juju Reese. So um, it'll be interesting to see. Illinois doesn't necessarily have that post score like a Zach Eady or Hunter Dickinson in the Big Ten that can get Reese in foul trouble. So it's going to be up to the wings to guard these two, um, two weapons. Shannon, a transfer from Texas Tech, is really just blossom into a star. He's averaging 20 points per game, 43% from three. The guy um, is a super athletic player. If you can limit him in transition and make him play in the half court, he's very right-hand dominant. So if you're able to you know, close off his windows and transition, make sure that he's not getting out in the free-flowing offense and make him play in the half court, that's where you can limit him. And you also have to have an emphasis on his shooting. 
you're going to have to close out on him, you know, in, in a way I would expect to keep Hart to guard him in, in a most likely matchup. So Hart is going to have to stay disciplined, not overcommit on drives, make sure that you're connected to, to Shannon. And then Coleman Hawkins, really one of like NBA draft Twitter's darlings. Um, he's a versatile four man, really can dribble the ball. He's only got around nine points per game, but his impact is kind of pro- more profound than that. He allows for Illinois to play that four out one in offense that Maryland kind of plays. And he's a super versatile, you know, um, forward. It's a huge matchup for Dante Scott. Scouts will be in the building because they both kind of rival each other. Scouts may be a little better shooter. Um, Coleman Hawkins a little more versatile with the ball in his hands. But I think those two matchups are really going to set the key. If Illinois um, is getting Shannon going, if he's hitting three, four threes, and, you know, around his 20 points per game, I think it's going to be tough for Maryland. And if Coleman Hawkins explodes and dominates Scott on both ends, it's going to be tough for them to score. So I would watch out for those two especially um, because freshman point guard Sky Clark, I wouldn't expect too much of a big game out of him from Illinois just in that in that first big atmosphere, guys. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart are also both uh, shooting 43% from three. Oh, Maryland could shoot it. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, they. so I think Illinois has to, they're going to have to try and. It's the same thing on both sides of the same ball. Same thing. Both, yeah. both these teams, they, I wouldn't say they have very similar play styles, but they've come away with very similar I, results. I, th- I would agree that I think that the two of them are more similar than I, in a lot of ways. I think Illinois before the preseason is kind of the version of Maryland, you know, versatile four man Scott, Coleman Hawkins, both can shoot it. Both are, you know, able to put it on the floor point guards that haven't really proven themselves i mean jameer young is obviously a transfer but scott clark is a freshman but they're both kind of unproven commodities in the big 10 and then you kind of just start filling out the roster with wings who can shoot donald Carey, hakeem hart illinois has kind of the same idea so i would agree with you kevin that they're they're a little bit similar in terms of playing style i would think that um this maryland team has definitely shaped into something that maybe not everyone expected like most definitely look across the board just like looking at some numbers it's they're, everyone's doing everything across the board. Everyone's getting back on defense. Rebounds are looking like everyone's filling out on the rebounds. You got uh, Julian Reese is leading with eight, but going down the line, there's guys averaging six rebounds, five rebounds. So everyone's doing a part. Everyone. It seems like everyone's bought into Willard's play style that they want to play hard, traditional basketball. I mean, everything's easier when you're winning, right? And, and Maryland's been blowing teams out. And so the one thing you got to look for is this is going to most Definitely. likely be a close game. And Illinois has been in a couple this year. Um, Maryland They're is, tested. Maryland is not, and so when it comes down to that, it, that's what we got to look for. Yeah, I think that um, this game is is going to be a huge test, and um, you, you're going to have to you're going to just have to kind of see what happens with Il- Maryland if they can compete with one of the, the Big Ten's best team on the other side of the basketball alley, the women's basketball team, um, who you know very well. Uh, I would say a little bit. Um, lost to DePaul and kind of a they played in the Fort Myers tip off invitational we're not a visual co- podcast but Brennan did just sneer um DePaul it is an upset but I think a lot of people are undervaluing DePaul they're the sixth best offense in the country they have the nation's leading scorer they've made the tournament 25 out of the past 30 years with their head coach so while it was an upset I think that loss isn't necessarily something that could, could come to bite Maryland in the back but really the big storyline I think that came out of the um that tournament is diamond miller she left the pit game midway through the third quarter guys without she went to the locker room and she did not have an apparent injury she was um, a quote from brenda free said that we hold diamond to a really high standard on both ends of the floor so she left the game did not return and w- there was no report of an injury involved it was clear that she was very frustrated with something that was occurring on the floor potentially her not getting enough touches her shot not falling i wasn't at the game so i can't say but i think that's a huge storyline to look at your senior star forward you know, not coming back into a game. Maryland eventually won it, but I think that when you look at something like that, uh, I mean, Freeze has obviously got a very strong culture, so I wouldn't necessarily worry about that, um, you know, falling into other alleys of the game, but I just think that that's, that's pretty big when you look at it's that. A, it's a weird thing for the leader of the team to do, it, which she is. Yeah, I mean, she's she is the star. Is this something along the lines of maybe the player thinks she's bigger than the team? I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't necessarily say that. I mean, I don't want to blow this I, out of proportion. No, no. Maybe, yeah, maybe I mean, she did I have an injury that seems just like a little bit of hot, on. like hot take I think radio she, type. Yeah. But like, I that would no, be worst case. case scenario. I mean, I think yeah. I think if she really thought that coming into the season, she would have left. Yeah, exactly. That's so. a great point. I mean, she's one of True. the only. She's one of the only. St- Angel Reese left the program. Obviously, 
Miller decide to stay. And I, when you go to practices like and these games, she's one of the most vocal players on the team. She's extremely team oriented. I think it probably just has to do with something. I mean, she has had her injury problems. It might have been she just like tweaked something and it wasn't working the same way, and she just was like very frustrated with it, with that aspect. Or you know, but I wouldn't call her like, oh, I'm bigger than the team. I, I yeah. Miller doesn't really she, strike yeah, she me doesn't as that strike personality. Me as someone who's so no. like egotistical. Also, no, not she at all. She could have just like maybe picked up a knock, tweaked her ankle or something. That exactly. Wasn't wasn't apparent for an injury. Up yeah, the, you're up by not nah, twenty points, right? The team's not. I mean, I don't know. At the time, what was the score? It was like they were up like ten, so not like yeah, okay. not crazy. How much left in the game? It was the third quarter, like early into the third. Also, quarter. the team doesn't necessarily want to report that if it's like a small little thing. Like, yeah, it doesn't want to start. I would agree, but the thing that made it interesting was Freeze's comment after. Yeah, the game. absolutely. That was like the big. She could have just said, "Oh, it was something." She tweeted. She's like, "We hold Diamond to a very high standard that time, both ends of the floor, mm-hmm. that type of thing." So, yeah. I mean, it might have just been like maybe Freeze saying, "Like, yeah, Freeze saying, look, like you're not." You're not playing. You're not playing great. It's the same thing with like, I'm not gonna allow the star of the team to you know have this type have this type of attitude. Maybe if I mean even slouch shoulders that type of thing. That doesn't mean you're bigger than the team. It just means that you know you're not performing to the standard or holding yourself to the high standard that Freeze wants. And I think that's a huge storyline. They have a huge game today as we're recording on Thursday against Notre Dame. How does she respond? How does she bounce back? She was benched against Baylor early in the earlier in the season. Responded with her career high points in that same game, so I think it's uh, she's a very clearly um, somebody who responds well to challenges. So I think that'll be super interesting. Yeah, something tells me that Coach Freeze is just trying to get the best out oh. of her. And I mean, Freeze like, is a coaching veteran; she yeah. knows what she's doing. She's just maybe struggling on the court, trying to like fit into these offensive sets that you see, and maybe defensively, as she said, both sides of the ball. Yeah, but I th- I'm pretty confident that Miller will uh, definitely bounce back. Bounce back. Yeah. Someone who did play great that game was Abby Myers, though, finishing yeah. with over 20 points. She's been huge. Yeah. I mean, absolutely massive, Mike. I mean, when you look at somebody like her coming in from Princeton, I mean, her shooting is, has been ridiculous for the Terps. Um, so that'll that'll be a, a huge game as we're recording against. And then next weekend, UConn comes to town. So <laughs> as we've talked about, that schedule does not get any lighter. Team whose schedule did get lighter at the end of the year, football team, boys. Finished out with a good win for the Terps. Um, Brennan, talk to us about uh, it. Yeah. The real first blowout against a Big Ten opponent. Um, Rutgers. <laughs> <laughs> Clarification. They're in the Big Ten. Uh, they get demoted to finish. the XFL. <laughs> <laughs> USC comes to town. It might be Rutgers, you guys. And I, I was saying this to you in class. Like, if this was two years from now, uh, Big Ten would have had you know, seven teams in the top 20. Like, <laughs> yeah, no. It's going to get interesting here. Um, Yeah, finishes the regular season. Uh, seven, Maryland finished racing seven and five. Going to get a bowl game. Um, the biggest thing that I've been noticing looking forward is how many players have opted out of bowl games and how many players Wild. have transferred. And it's just something as a fan of the game that breaks my heart. Holy old school take. The people <laughs> well, who are dropping out, like Jacob Copeland and Dante Dimas. I mean, Dimas didn't even have that great of a year this year. Yeah, neither like, did Copeland. I mean, it's CJ Dupree. <laughs> but when you're trying to transfer. Rest in, rest in oh, my God. That. I, I, I think that I might think make that, me cry. I, that might sign though that Corey Deitches is in for like a right. much larger role. I would True. think, you know, and, and that'll be interesting. To it's watch. just very confusing. Like, all right, a big name wide receiver yeah. from Ohio State dropping out last year. Stroud, okay, Stroud not playing. You know, those that makes things. sense. But these wide receivers who are going to go these late. Guys are, to they're not. The they're not I can tell you, Jacob Copeland's probably not getting drafted. And then Demas. If this was last year, that would make sense. I, I understand Demas a little more just because of the injury history. You don't want to necessarily risk your, you know, you're already had a prior ACL tear. You know, you're you're more vulnerable to another one in a kind of meaningless bowl game. And why play in the Rutgers game? Yeah, but these guys are still trying to, they're still trying to show out. This I'm is going to be their biggest and, yeah, I'm not excusing, I'm not excusing it, but I'm just saying, like, it is their, it is, if he, I mean, I've seen stories. I respect the Demas decision because he's coming yeah. back from that injury. He did. He wasn't moving great throughout the year. No, it's, he still he did has not a look like the same player. He had to go all. through, but um, I think that I I can understand the I Demas can, dropout. Yeah. But I don't know Copeland. It's like you're still trying to show out. You got to prove something. It's, you you can get both alleys. I mean, I agree with Cav. I, I the Demas one makes way more sense to me. But it's um. Uh, to, to go to Cavett's point about showing out, this is like Demas' last chance to show out. Like, he had that weak regular season. And obviously, I mean, you it appears that the ACL injury affected his mobility, the way he was able to move, like, the years before. So I would think if I'm Demas, I'd want to play in that last game to be able to show the scouts what I can do one last time. Because if you look at his draft odds 
after this season, last year, they were probably pretty high. Mm. But this season, they're probably pretty low because the injury, Scott's going to think he can't play like he used to. Yeah, he's looking, to me, he's looking like the late-round pick. If that. I mean, yeah, I, if he's, that. he's probably a priority yeah, was, UDFA. If that was, that yeah. there, there's a couple things, right? So, like, when you're building a, a football program, Loxley said it so many times, like, the Maryland football team has built up their bowl win last year in the Pinstripe Bowl so much as, like, a marquee recruiting point. Um, and the other part of it is, like, when you sign up to play on the team, I guess it's not how it works, but when you commit, when you buy in, you ideally want to be playing football in January. That's the goal. You want to win a national championship. And so m- was Maryland realistically going to do that? No. But when you come to the NCAA and you're going to play football, cutting your season short, to me, I understand for the injuries, but – to build a program, it just ruins that entire goal. I think it's like a, I think it's a very complex argument because I understand where Brennan's coming from. I get what like both Kevin and Mike say about Copeland and you know like his and Demas and that. But it also then you look at the other side and and I'm just kind of playing from the player's of perspective course. here is that this bowl game, in a way, it's kind of it's a little bit meaningless. Absolutely, like, it does not like have a great impact on. Um, what you're what you're looked at in terms of your season that type of thing yeah it's a nice pin a nice you know pin on your resume but it's not something that like or a pin stripe on your resume right yeah exactly pun intended but like I mean <laughs> when, you, when you look at that like there are stories like Jake Butt I remember when I was a kid Jalen Smith these are guys who were projected first round picks Jake Butt plays in the Orange Bowl which is a much notor- like more notorious bowl game than what Maryland will be playing in. it's the New Year's Six Bowl he tears his ACL. His draft stock, he was projected like a second-round pick, falls to the sixth round. His career kind of flamed out before it even started because he would he tore both his ACLs. Jalen Smith was projected top 15 pick, tears his Achilles in the Notre Dame-Ohio State game in the Fiesta Bowl, another New Year's Six Bowl, and he's injured, and you know his draft stock falls. He falls, I think, to the second or third round. So, I mean, these are just examples of guys I think that you, know, you, you do sign up to play in that, but when you get to that point – Sometimes training for the draft and though and that I mean bowl preparation is like a month month and a half thing. Training for the draft sometimes can be more beneficial to your future. And I don't think any of us here would like debate or hate on somebody trying to go get their bag. Basically, you know, try to get drafted as high as you can. Puts That's a lot more pressure on the defense. I'll say. Puts a lot more pressure on the defense to step up that I mean, game. Like, I mean, let's losing. be honest here though. Like Copeland and Demas like haven't been like. They're Co- not. Copeland was a solid guys. weapon for them. I mean, I, but like Deshaun Jones and, and right. well, I don't think is Jarrett playing. I, he de- he already basically declared. Uh, you saw it in the Snapchat thing. It was like, thank yeah, you, Terp I mean, Nation. I would so, really doubt yeah. he plays. It, but on the other side, it also gives a chance for Maryland's young players mm-hmm. to step up, which True. I think is something to look at. Like these are guys who are going to be gone anyway. Why not get a better look at some of the players who will be here? I mean, the time baby we saw last year, but exactly, it just ruins team chemistry. You're going into a bowl game with you know. Ten tran- without ten trans people are ten people are transferring and the transfer pe- one is people, a little people who are leaving. Cab, what do you think? Yeah, I think that like you've come all this way, you've committed, you've signed up, you've played Division One football for how many years? Don't you just want to get back out there one more time? Because you're play- like we're all athletes. We've played sports on teams. It's you just want to be out there with your teammates one last time. Yeah. It's a complex. Throw on that, it's a, it's throw a super. On that it's like turp <laughs> one more time. I it's agree. Just, it's a very like I feel gray like issue. You gotta, do you want to protect really, this house? <laughs> yeah. Max, Max, they got a Max. I mean, like I feel like if you if you really love the sport and you love what you're doing, then yeah. But I don't think saying like Dante Demas doesn't love the sport. I mean, the guy came back from an ACL tear and came back for yeah. a whole like. It's That's, just like it's yeah, a the, super. Well, the injuries is, is a completely different case. It's just a super complicated and like. And then you can get even into, like, these bowl games and make so much money, but, like, the players before didn't. Like, it's just, like, something you look at. And we could talk here for hours, but, I mean, yeah. eventually you have to move on. And team who also uh, had to move on in their season was the men's soccer team, Calf. Yeah, unfortunately, the Maryland men's soccer team went crashing out in the second round of the NCAA tournament. To Maybe the committee was right. <laughs> Maybe the been. committee was right, but <laughs> I that, hate to admit some it. Some harsh, harsh conditions that game was played in. Woo. It was played to a nil-nil draw until the 85th minute when Cornell bagged one, and that I don't know Cornell bagged two actually, yeah, and then Maryland, Maryland tried mounting a late comeback with a goal in probably the 88th minute. If there was a cup of water out there, it would have froze. It it was <laughs> snowing, windy. The grass looked just 
the pitch just looked Can you unpleasant. even call that grass? It just looked unpleasant. It was yeah. brutal conditions up Very different guy. conditions just, from the uh the World Cup. It was just it's tough conditions to play in, but that's the nature of the beast. It's part of the game. You got to be able to adapt to that. It's um not an excuse for it yeah. was a, it was a sloppy game all around. Maryland didn't look like maybe they just <laughs> Honestly, they didn't look like they got a good night's sleep. It was just they came out of the gate lazy. They didn't look like the Maryland that we've seen through Big Ten play this year. It's just they they fell flat on their faces on what could have been a very, very interesting playoff run for them. Another team that fell flat on their faces, which could have been an interesting playoff run for them, was the field I mean, hockey team. It was the final team. four, Mike. Yeah, yeah, well, a little bit. I don't know if y'all saw uh, the, the left bench show, but yeah, I, big Mike on the <laughs> show. Also, check out my story on Bremen Day. Know, if we're doing self plugs. Um, I said that it was kind of Maryland disappointing for them. Um, <laughs> it's a little disappointing when you look at how the offense played for Maryland early on in the season. Uh, they averaged four point two goals per game. Their first 15 matches, and then their last six matches, they declined to only 2.1 goals a game. So when you enter a season with a high-powered offense, and you're like, "This is what's going to lead the team, and we might, you know, we're going to win a title because of this," and then in the end, that production just immediately declines out of nowhere, and you lose in the final four because of that. It's got to be a little disappointing for the girls. Yeah, definitely. I mean, but you still get all the way to the final four. Mm-hmm. It's still probably, you know, it's a disappointing outcome, but. When you look in terms of not just Maryland's scope of field hockey, successful season for them. So mm-hmm. um, I'm sure Missy Maharg and, and her notorious recruiting classes and different transfers she'll pull in will have, be back. We'll have them yeah. back. It's not like they lost to a bad team. They got no. all the way to the final right. four. They just mm-hmm. couldn't get over the finish line. It's also disappointing you lose to the same Big Ten opponent. Yeah, like that's a, that's a lot. Twice yeah. in three weeks. Yes. Yeah, definitely. But, I mean, I think that pretty much – we have a lot of stuff we got into about Maryland. Um, and Adam we, Hughes still has his job. <laughs> <laughs> that question can can be held off till next week. Um, but next, next year, maybe. Don't ask me that for a year, please. Some of, some of the more uh, – <laughs> something that was, was close as well, Mike. Mike, tell him. Tell him the standings. We've been on high edge here in the yeah, podcast okay. studio. We've been on what? So high edge. I still lead at thirteen and ten. I mean, this guy blew it up like it was like a tie, and he's like, I still what? Lead. Well, wait, let's get to it. Cavett is next at twelve, ten, and one. After Cavett is Brendan at twelve and eleven. Oh, oh my god, oh my god. Oh. that tie is it's coming. tight. It's, it's tight. And then uh, <laughs> Sam is eleven. And 12. Oh, I'm so back. I'm so back. <laughs> I'm back though. I, we're we're two games out of the leaderboard, Mike. Wow. And plus, once we get into college basketball, folks, say good night. I am a Ooh. deadly dealer on the on the basketball slate. So now we I'll enter that championship weekend in college football. Um, not a lot of games to choose from this week. Makes it where the best. Come I don't out of see the best. any UMass game on the slate. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're done. <laughs> I'm not even pick. Yeah, um, Mike, awesome. give it to us. Uh, first one: Utah USC over 67 and a half. Uh, both teams can score the ball. It's the Pac-12. Utah's um, an awful. Uh, saying, USC's an awful defense. So. It's going to be a, a high. Pick. It's going to be a high scoring a game, pick. a game that I for some reason I feel like it's not going to be high scoring. It's going to be TCU Kansas State. I don't know for some reason I just feel like it's going to be low scoring. Oh my God, Mike coming in with a vibes pick. <laughs> wow. I don't mean to steal your flow, Cavett. <laughs> and then uh, last is Ohio plus right. one and a half versus Toledo. That's a banana's how about, pick. How about some action, boys? <laughs> some action, how baby. How about it? Shout uh, out Barstool. Ohio is nine and three Actually, against no, the spread. No free shout outs here. And From Toledo is four and eight. So there you go. All right, on to my picks. Uh maybe Sam don't listen. Maybe do listen. Maybe chirp me after this one. Uh Purdue plus seventeen. Keep Michigan. doubting Michigan, man. I did it. Them boys are hot. Uh seventeen points is a lot of points. My reasoning's Purdue's awful. I mean, if you watched the Big they Ten Championship Maryland. last game. <laughs> oh, let's let's not get Michigan, ahead of ourselves. Uh, our Iowa got destroyed uh last year in the Big Ten Championship game. Um, yeah. So, what, so, so what's your reasoning? My <laughs> reasoning is that Michigan is going to way overlook this game. Uh, Michigan's going to win this game. Yeah. But I think maybe ten points. It's not. It's not. I, a, I think it's seventeen. Not necessarily the I think it's a lot of points. I think Purdue is a much better team than, uh, Iowa, than Iowa. Iowa. That's fair. And offensively, like Purdue can, can do they a little can bit score. of damage. They and absolutely so I think, can score. And I think you know it'll be a closer game. I just don't. I just. I think it'll be an interesting game. I think Michigan wins, but I could see them Purdue covering. Mm. And then my next pick is Clemson minus seven and a half versus UNC. Not really much to it here. Uh, 
Clemson, not the greatest end to the season, but I think they're going to take care of UNC. And then uh, TCU minus two and a half versus Kansas State. TCU is absolutely, you know, going for do, that playoff spot. Do you spot. think they're in if they lose? No, but no. that's a completely think that's a completely different subject. No, I'm just like it's just a quick quick question. No, that's that's, my, that's why I'm picking this. They know they need to basically. Win I this would game. say they could still make it. I I think that I don't they think could. So. If over Ohio State, well, no, Ohio State doesn't play. Uh, yeah, many hypotheticals. I think that they want to get in, so win by three points and make me happy and make yourselves happy. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, that's like the that's a that's an interesting one. I think if you if TCU were to lose hypothetically, I think. I think they're going to win that game, and I think if they do win that game, it's no, going to be. If by they three. win, they're oh, and I think, and I'd be shocked if it's. I, I'd be shocked I, if it's by within seven. Yeah, yeah I agree. They should they should blow them out. That this line makes no sense. Last time I if was against tr- Baylor, I took it, and so who knows if they're a true playoff team, they should. Yeah, I mean, take care exactly. Of they, but they, they have been they've have been in tight tight games. I just so. love watching their little Twitter. Jokes. Yeah, they're they're, they're Twitter. Yeah. They're so cute. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to go um, with USC minus two and a half. I think USC really, if we talk about TCU, USC is playing for their playoff spot. I mean, if they lose, mm-hmm. they're they're done. So they have to win, and I like them to beat um, Utah. Um, LSU and Georgia under 52 and a half. No real reasoning for this one. I just think this is a game where Georgia kind of bleeds the clock out. They should be up by two, three scores against LSU. Um, so I could see that one definitely being under 52 and a half. And then I have two lane minus four against uh, UCF. The Green Wave, that I've rode with them this year. I like them a lot. I think it would be really interesting if it was a 12-team playoff. They'd be in right now. Oh, yeah. But we're not talking about that, so that'll be really exciting once we get into future years of the playoff. The, years, yeah. the line, I looked at it last night. It was one and a half. So can I match your line, too, since we're doing the same game? And take Yeah, it? I mean, uh, if, if you – yeah, I think that's Last fair. night it was – okay. What, what game? It's Ohio. two lane. Oh, right. that's a different said, game, Mike. 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 So Jesus, yeah. Mike. <laughs> Mike. That's awesome. Mike is cross conferencing right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only way I can get the University of Maryland involved in championship weekend. Oh, <laughs> uh, <but> you're. <laughs> let's that's go hideous. for it. I'm going to say first game. Um. Same pick as Sam. I'm going USC minus two and a half. The Utes, they just don't have it. Too much riding on it for the Trojans of Southern California. Um, contrarily to the Brendan Weissel pick, I am taking UNC plus seven and a half against Clemson. Clemson is, uh, I'm just not feeling them. They're not good. <laughs> All time jersey matchup, by the way. We Great. That's a really, a, really, really good point. That's a a especially if Clemson wears the purple. I was thinking if I was orange. just thinking Clemson wear orange and then but the purple is so fire. They are so fire. But and I, UNC wears the UNC powerful? comes out with the baby blues. Oh That's my just God. That could just I, be all the, time with the with the uh, the old paisley down. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you can show that off. The, thanks. Yeah, the paisley down the um down the sides. That's what a, just a beautiful pattern. Quick question: What do we rate out of ten the USC UCLA when they both wear their home jerseys? I think that's so like when USC wears the red and, and UCLA, UCLA wears, wears the blue. The blue. It, they do it every year. It's that's, like the only thing in college great. football. I think it's, it's a great. ten. Uh, you, Ohio State and Michigan should do the same thing, in my opinion. They should. They should. Why not? Wear like the why blue not? I, yeah, I agree. And Michigan State should burn those state jerseys. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> anyway, jumping into the next game. Um, on oh, my last pick, I am taking the Georgia LSU over at 52 and a half. College football championship weekend points. Who wants fun. to see an under? Who wants to see it? Life's too short to bet the under. Come on. We want fun. We want excitement, scoring. Let's go. This is, we're in for an electric weekend. These are some great matchups. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of. I mean, I think Georgia's going to absolutely yeah, smoke, smoke them, them but, but I, th- eh, I don't know. They, it, it's like it's honestly it, this week is really going to separate because we have so many similar bets. I think this can really you know yeah. show that championship caliber for whoever comes through. Sam Jane hasn't been able to show it yet. Hey Mike. The Ohio the line is now Ohio plus three. Are you the only so guy who's, take I, what, you the only guy who's negative? He, is he the only one with a negative win percentage? Uh, right hold on, let me. Or I don't need he... glasses to see that. It is negative. Uh, <laughs> that's not nice. Mike, you just brought out the glasses joke. You should be. Freaking expolitated from this that, podcast. Uh, I would like to say that that's <laughs> not, a, not word. a word. We've had this debate. It is a word. It is um, most it's certainly a, not a word. It's been an absolutely beautiful week here at the University of Maryland. Uh, looking outside last night of my dorm, I saw a lot of gold. Yeah. Got Trevor Terrapin right into gold, Sam. I do. And he came through in, in multiple gold matches here. And, and that's Anthony Cowan Jr. The reason we're picking him um, in 20. 20- 
uh, for, um, sorry, in Turner, 2019 Turner. it was, he came back in a gold rush game against Illinois to when Maryland History was— History does tend to repeat itself. I'm just saying, 3-10 uh, and 0 Maryland team ranked third in the country, so a little higher than this year. They were down against um, Illinois— it was a it was a tight game, fifty six or fifty five to fifty eight. Um, Illinois was leading, but Cowan had the ball with twenty one seconds left. Stepped back for three, hit a deep three pointer to tie it. Then forced a steal on the ensuing Illinois possession. Got fouled, hit the free throw. Then purposely missed the second free throw so that Illinois couldn't get a set play, and the Terps escaped with a victory over Illinois. Really, just a special moment and a special career for Cowan, who averaged ten point three. Um, points and 3.7 assists as a freshman he was a highly ranked recruit 62nd in the country um, played on the dc assault amir athletic union team um, you know in that dmv area that a lot of people um, mm-hmm. were angry with turgeon for not recruiting this was kind of one of his wins cowan then really stepped up in his sophomore year had over a five point per game jump really became kind of that leader on that he team. was the he was the heart of the team the year that, that when COVID canceled it you know maryland was that was the next third. year, and they but, that, they but were. Like Cowan was the heart. Yeah, I mean, they had Jalen Smith that year. That was a talented team. He still was the guy on that on that team. I mean, and then that next year, as a junior, champs, yeah, as a junior in that COVID year, as he LeBlanc. led the team with fifteen point six assists and our fifteen point six points and four point four assists per game. Named a second all team All Big Ten. Those are just some stats. But really, it was just kind of Cowan's like ferocity. He kind of came in after Melo Trimble. That's a lot of you know burden and expectations to get placed under you know in terms of filling that point guard role and he really just like fulfilled it in, in terms of and stepped up to the expectations i mean the guy was a stud he was clutch in the stretch it really is a shame that they didn't get that 2020 postseason year because i think that was easily turgeon's best team um at maryland and it would have been kind of re- all fell apart after that it would have been really cool to see cowan in the tournament and a chance to you know make his mark because that team was good <laughs> they won the big tennis cavett said jalen smith and him were pretty good dynamic duo especially in pick and roll when and pick and pop when Cowan and Smith connected. And I just think Cowan, if you're looking at a guy who really embodied what Maryland was about in the point guard position, somebody who could create their own shot, uh, maybe a little undersized, but was able to, you know, distribute the basketball and, and step up in big moments, that that was Cowan. And I, I know as a non-Maryland fan growing up, I always loved watching him because I thought his game was just super, like, just smooth. He was a smooth player That and talking in adjectives. Cowan on uh, John Rothstein's top 20 Maryland players. You know who else was on that list? Gist. To the I to the S to the T. James, James Gist. Gist. Dog. Friend, Friend of the, the pod. pod. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, Cowan. James Gist, who did he, he recently signed with a team in the Turkish basketball he did, league. Yes, yeah. he's averaging eight points a game right now. Attaboy, Still Gist. Going. Still right. going, baby. Well, he's going to dunk when he's 45. I'm going to get the name of that team in five. just a second. Yeah, and he is playing for... Basik Shahir Kaleji of the oh, Super naturally. League. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on that note, Cav. I mean, Cowan, guys, Friday, Illinois, history repeats itself. That's the a question Xfinity that we, Center will be we can't answer. If you're a fan of Maryland, go to this game. Scott Van Pelt will be there for all journalism students who want to make their, hi, Scott, I'm blank, blank. This is a chance. That is literally going to be you. That's you, Sam. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. For, I mean, Is this a stormable game? I mean, no. do we, oh, that's a do great we even, even want to no, mention not the Star Roman Hemby moment? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> Completely normal thing to say. But anyway. A buzzer of, beater makes it stormable. None of the audience knows this. This is all rambling. Cav it taken away. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Under the Shell, presented by Terrapin Sports Central. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy. Have a good one.